Well, good morning, everybody. Come on in and, and find your seats. We're glad that you could be here and gathered with us here as Lebanon Baptist Church this morning. Thank you so much uh, for being here this morning. If you're a guest, we're really glad that you're here with us. And if this is your first time, we'd love to know that you are here. And so if you wouldn't mind just scanning the QR code in front of you, and uh, that will pull up a contact form, and then uh, you can sign up and let us know you are here, and then we will send you a uh, email with a special gift inside. It's a free cup of coffee uh, to Crazy Love Coffee House. Jeff, I can still hear the iPod playing through here. It's really nice. It makes me feel good. Um, but uh, guests, thank you for being here. And let me just say, if you've been visiting Lebanon for a little while now, but you haven't yet met the pastoral team, uh, myself, Pastor Brian, Pastor Hester, and Pastor Josh, uh, we'd love to meet you today at the conclusion of the gathering. If you go right out these doors and you kind of go right, there'll be kind of a classroom reception area for guests. And uh, if, so if you've been visiting for a while, LBC, but you haven't met the pastoral team, we'd love to get to know you personally. So make sure that you do that at the conclusion of our gathering. Tonight, uh, there's just want to put on y'all's radar again, there's a ball ground church plant meeting tonight in ball ground. Uh, please be in prayer for that group of people who some of them are people from our church and then some are from pe people from the community and they're meeting together regularly now to kind of discuss what the formation of a church plant in ball ground would look like. And uh, if you've been around Lebanon, you know that our heart and passion is to really plant new churches. We believe that the gospel advances when churches are planted. So pray, please pray for the ball ground meeting tonight. And if you're interested in that, you can connect with Pastor Josh or Pastor Brian. On October the 14th, there's a church work day. You want to put that on your radar. Uh, that's when we all gather together to help Tim Pulver uh, tame the wild frontier of Lebanon's uh, campus. And uh, it'll be a lot of working outside. Tim needs a lot of help. There is a lunch provided, so we'll send out sign-ups in just a little bit. And then if you can bring tools and things to help with the project on the 14th, uh, make sure that you connect with Tim. But Church Work Day on the 14th. And then finally, uh, we have a desire to, to have a church camping trip, an outing, um, in November. And we think it'd be really great to get the church together just camping together uh, in the wilderness. I'm not sure where, um, but we would be camping together. But we really uh, need help and really somebody who could take this by the horns and really drive it, um, finding the right places to be and just really kind of guiding uh, that church camping trip and all the details for it. So if you're like an outdoorsman or an outdoors woman and you would like to be a help um, with planning a church camping trip in November at the conclusion of the gathering, um, Caleb Sturgis and Sam Adams are going to be right down here in front. Uh, we'd love for you to connect with them uh, because if it's possible, we'd love to do a camping trip in November. Those are all of the announcements that I have for this morning. And now let's turn our hearts towards the theme of our gathering. And the theme of our gathering um, comes from Isaiah chapter 6. This morning we're going to be singing about the glory of our holy God. And our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 6. The scripture says these words. Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having a burning in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Here in this chapter of Isaiah, we see a vision of a holy God, high and lifted up. And yet we see when man comes into the presence of God, there is a keen understanding and awareness that we are undone. That there's something wrong with us. There's sin in our hearts. We're not pure. We're not clean. But what I love about this story, this chapter in Isaiah, is that God makes the sinner clean. He pardons guilt and he atones for sin through the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross so that guilty sinners could approach with boldness and joy to the throne of the holy God. And that's what we're worshiping this morning. That's what we're praising God for, is that he receives sinners even though he is completely holy. He's done that through the sacrifice of his son on the cross. Would you pray with me? Father, we pause for a moment And when we think about the holiness of God, apart from grace, we're terrified because we know that the judgment of our sin deserves a just punishment. We know that we're undone, that we could never approach you, but Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood that atones for sin so that we can approach you and call you Father. We can run to you in our hour of need boldly and with great joy because we know that you receive sinners. Thank you for the power of the gospel to purify our hearts. And Lord, I pray that as we live as your people on this earth, that you who called us to be holy, that we would be holy like you. Help us on a daily basis to fight sin and to live in the grace that you've called us to. We pray all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together now and we'll begin singing of the holiness of our great God. Be unto your name.
faithful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. something about the holiness of God that the eye of sinful man cannot quite comprehend. That's why we need God's grace. That's why we need God's help. Because apart from his grace, we could never see and understand the holiness of our great God. Let's sing together, Lord, I need you.
great singing. You can be seated. I trust that is the prayer of your heart. I trust that today God will indeed be your sustenance as you have asked him, God, I need you today. And I trust his word will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Uh, this morning, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5 for our scripture reading. This is not our text for the message today, but it is one that I thought I'd like to direct you to and read before you this morning. Uh, of course, Matthew 5 is a, uh, a section of scripture that records for us uh, really the most famous sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. It was just this past March that a group of our church uh, visited the Holy Land, and uh, we visited uh, the proposed spot of where uh, this sermon was preached, and uh, the Mount of Beatitudes. And as we looked across that, I, I talked and gave a little bit of this particular message. Now think about it. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament Scripture. He had arrived on the scene. Israel, of course, loved the law. They loved uh, what it had, or they said they loved it. Of course, sometimes they didn't obey it. But now Jesus is on the scene, the fulfillment of the law, the one who lived perfectly according to it. And in this sermon, he begins to talk about really what they need and really apply the law to their own hearts. And so I'd like to read, I'm going to begin by reading just uh, two, uh, a few verses at the beginning and then move down. And my main text that I'll read is beginning in verse 17. But let me just set it up by reading the first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 1. It says this, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Of course, he's opening them up to the brokenness. They would have seen that they had not fulfilled the law. They needed something more. And then Jesus begins to say and illustrate really what the law demanded of them. Look what it says in verse 17. He, he says this, Do not think that I, Jesus, have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother will be liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put into prison. Truly I say unto you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
And if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it, it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not fear, uh, swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say unto you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take away, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sins reigned on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless the reading of his word. This morning, for our corporate prayer time, I would like to pray in reference to next week. Uh, many of you know that next Sunday we have a special speaker, which means that we will have a combined life stage class here in the auditorium at 9.30. And then at 10.30, uh, uh, Steve Pettit, the former president of Bob Jones University, he traveled on evangelism for numbers of years, is going to be our focus for a day that we have set aside as kind of our mission Sunday, Lebanon Baptist Church for ATL. We want all of you, if you are a follower of Christ, to live your life on mission. And part of the mission is to be a disciple in the very area that God has pinned you. You are to live and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And this whole day is going to be designed, particularly in the morning, to remind you of that task to live out your mission for Jesus Christ. And of course, anytime we have any service here, everybody is welcome and the gospel will be shared. And I trust in the morning that, of course, you can invite. We always want you to do that. But particularly in the evening, we are going to give you an opportunity to really try to reach some people in our community. We are going to have a special barbecue and bluegrass concert. And Steve Pettit has an incredible group of young people, and they are good when it comes to bluegrass music. It is something that you will feel really good about inviting people to. So we will have a bunch of free food, free barbecue, and then a time where they're going to do this concert. And, and at one point in the concert, Steve is going to share the message of Jesus. And what a great opportunity for you to invite coworkers, friends, neighbors to be a part of this. And what we've been challenging you over the last few weeks is three people. Who are three people that you are trying to reach? Whether, whether it's a, an unsafe family member, an unsafe neighbor, a coworker, I mean, I, I, I have someone I've targeted that I run into at Publix at Rucker Road on a 
consistent basis. And I'm praying that he is going to come and bring his family. I've got some neighbors. Who do you have that you are going to invite? Okay, let me just remind you. If you don't put a hook in the water, okay, you're not going to catch a fish. Okay, now, sometimes maybe there's a flying fish and they just show up or whatever. And, uh, but I want everyone to put a hook in the water. Okay, that means invite someone. And Mark's done something great for us to just do, to invite. There's an email. I mean, you can forward the email. How easy is that? Okay, I mean, I don't mind if you spam people with this, okay? Okay, so, and invite your, uh, if you're, if you have a group of people in your neighborhood that you know, invite them and, and have them come. And uh, we do want to know if you're coming and maybe who you're inviting so we can plan on enough food. So we're going to ask that you do that. But let me encourage you that 6 o'clock next Sunday evening. So let me go ahead right now, and I'm going to pray particularly for next Sunday that God would use it in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I am already anticipating if for some reason your son doesn't come back this week that you will give us another chance to present the gospel. Lord, we know to be with you would be far better. But if for some reason you tarry your coming, Lord, I ask that you would help us to be a church that is constantly trying to bring others to the message of Jesus. Lord, would you use the services next Sunday morning to awaken us out of our lethargy, that you would move us from our mediocrity when it comes to our spiritual life, and that you would remind us again of that great commission, and that, Father, we would be those who would once again shed tears and have great burden for those, if they don't hear of Jesus, will spend eternity in hell. Lord, I ask that you would press upon our hearts who you would have us to invite. And then, Lord, would you give us the boldness and the priority in life to do it. And, Lord, would you bring numbers of people here and that, Father, you would take away distractions and would you allow it to just be a special event. And, Lord, I ask that you would save some people that people would, their whole lives would be changed as a result of hearing the gospel next Sunday. Lord, would you guide in everything that's done? Would you fill Steve Pettit with your spirit? And would you allow great work to be done for, for eternity's sake? In Jesus' name, amen. When I contemplate the holiness of our God One of my first thoughts that follows that is, Lord, why me? Why did you choose me? Why did you bring me into your family? I'm a a person who doesn't deserve to be a part of your family, but it's the amazing love of God that answers that question. He loves us even in spite of our sin, and he beckons us to come to him. Let's all stand together and sing, And Can It Be? Yeah.
you're controlled by the amazing love of God, then the most natural or proper response is to say, Lord, here's my heart. You, holy God, make your home in my heart. Do whatever it takes. Cast out every sin that remains, and you reign supreme. God reigning in your life. Let's sing together. Oh, great God. children at the conclusion right down this hallway. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles now to the letter that we have been studying uh, for now. I think this is message 28 in the book of Romans. And so turn to Romans 7. And of course, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul one of the converts of Jesus wrote under the inspiration of God to a church that was founded in the center of the world of that ancient world, the city of Rome. Of course, we know that all roads led to Rome, and of course, all roads led away from Rome. And if this particular city would understand the gospel, if they would embrace it, if they would understand it rightly, oh, how that world could be impacted. And of course, as the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, his goal, of course, is to continue to see this church established and grown in the gospel so that he could take the gospel to Spain. And of course, he mentions that in the letter. And at this point, we are uh, kind of in the midst, in the heart of the letter, uh, we come to chapter 7, and this morning I would like to focus our attention on just a few verses in the midst of this chapter. I'll begin reading verse 7, 
and I'll read through verse 13. Paul says in verse 7, what shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. You know, we're going to need help today, aren't we? What is Paul meaning here? What is he explaining? Do you not believe that the Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for you? so that you could live life for his glory's sake. So this text is profitable for you. But you're going to have to put your thinking caps on this morning, and you're going to have to say, God, help me to understand it. So let's ask him this morning. Father, we come to you again today asking for your Spirit's illumination. I ask for my help in my explanation of this. I ask that you would help there to be clarity I ask that you would enlighten our minds that we may be able to understand a little bit more of this aspect of the gospel, that you would help us today as Paul is seeking uh, many years ago to uh, rescue the law in some ways, but also put it in its right spot. Would you guide us to this end, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you know me, you will know that I'm not usually an impulse buyer. I am one who oftentimes researches and often waits way too long to finally make the purchase. I like to think through all the different angles, find the best coupon, find the best sale, and I don't want to be taken. I can still remember when I was in high school, one of my... uh, leaders of our group, we were on a mission trip to New York City, and we went into Chinatown. Okay, this is in the 90s, okay, and uh, my, my friend bought what he was real excited about for $40. He bought a brand new state-of-the-art CD player. Okay, this is when CD players were coming out. I got it for 40 bucks, and he's talking about this all the way back on the train. But when he finally got back, plugged it in, The only thing that worked was the radio, okay? He got taken. And of course, I razzed him for a long time in reference to it. For me, whether it's ancient coins in Israel, watches in Chinatown, is it a Gucci or not? Or coffee makers. I was just looking for a new coffee maker here in Roswell. I want to be confident that what I buy into, what I purchase is of true value. Paul, what he's doing, he's not peddling the gospel. He is offering the gospel again on a silver platter to these Romans. And he wants them to buy into it, to believe it, and to rest their lives in it. But there were some questions. Is Paul's gospel salvation by faith in Christ alone, by grace alone, Is it authentic? Is it real? Can I rely on it? If you really believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone, won't that lead to riotous living? 
I mean, if Jesus Christ forgave you of all your past sins, present sins, future sins, and he does it at a moment with justification, won't that lead to all of these people who are accepting it just going, hey, I've got like my get out of hell free card and I can just live the way I want to live. And that was kind of a, an accusation that Paul had encountered that he had anticipated with these people. And that's why he spends Romans 6 and Romans 7 addressing these questions and interacting with what we call a diatribe and asking these questions for these people and answering them. Shall we continue in sin because grace abounds? God forbid that we should do this. But then there was that other question. If what you're saying, Paul, about the gospel, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, and if we're really now no longer under the law, but under grace, won't that lead to a bunch of people living lawless lives? Hey, I can just, Ten Commandments, all that law stuff, it's gone, I'm under grace now. Hey, have at it. Because if Paul doesn't have an answer to that rightly, then why even accept this gospel? I mean, why do you actually believe that Jesus can really do all this? So he needed to answer this particular question. So he spends these chapters interacting with this. Of course, the driving message that Paul has been getting from chapter 1 to really chapter 7 here is that he's telling believers, when you believed in Christ, you are now in Christ And he is all that you need. He is sufficient to bring you to heaven. And you do now live under the realm of grace. That they did have something that was superior to the law. And that the Holy Spirit, who they get once they believe in Christ, helps to fulfill the law in their lives. In fact, and I'm giving you a little bit of a trailer. In Romans chapter 8, in just a little bit, he's going to say this about the spirit that lives inside of them. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the, and I believe this, the Mosaic law, weakened by our flesh, because you and I couldn't keep it. It caused us to fail. I mean, Our sin caused us to fail, but God answered it by sending his own son in the likeness, in our likeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And how do we do this? Who walk not according to the flesh. We don't live in the flesh anymore, but believers now live in this new realm of the Spirit, submitting their lives to him. And he's going to talk about that, and we're going to expand on that when we get to chapter 8. But does this mean, now here's the question, does this mean that the Mosaic law that Israel had from 1446 B.C. until Jesus Christ came, does that mean that the law, because it led to their sin and disobedience, does it mean that the law is sin? Does that mean, of course, I... I'm not going to go get it today. I was about, I, I brought the law again. Okay, I didn't hang it up there. But if you were here last week, I brought the Ten Commandments. I hung them on the cross. Okay, today they're, they're behind the stage. I was going to bring them out. But does that mean that the law, should we just drop kick the law? It's all done. It's sin. It hurt us. What do we do with the law? And what he does is he takes up that particular question in our text. And what I want you to learn this morning which I often do, I mean, maybe I'll, I need to provide a little bit of variety. Instead of giving you the main point at the beginning, I can sometimes bring it at the end. We can work inductively rather than deductively. But today, let me just give it to you right at the start. Here it is. A right understanding of the law, the Mosaic law, and sin can lead you to the Savior. I want you, and I think Paul did, he wanted them to have a right understanding of the law, and he wanted them to have a right understanding of sin, because when you begin to understand those things rightly, it opens you up to the gospel and the Savior. Okay, so let me, 
Let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever watched maybe a murder mystery on TV, and as the, as the show is progressing, you, you see the murder at the beginning, and then they like focus on this character and this character, and you're trying to figure out, okay, all right, who's the bad guy? Who are the good guys? And of course, they usually try to cause you to, oh, I think it's this person. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And, right, and oftentimes there's some sort of hero or a savior who gets it all figured out. In Romans chapter 7, what we do is we, did, we find this. We find who is good, what is good. We find who is bad, who's the murderer. But we're also in many ways pointed back to the savior, the hero. So let's dive into it and let's see what it says. Okay, verse 7, look what it says here. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would have not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So right at the beginning, this is what we're going to learn. And it's this recognize that the law, recognize the law as a good guy. Okay, got that? Recognize the law as a good guy. And he begins with that question. What shall we say? Is the law sin? Is the Mosaic law a bad guy? You know, uh, oftentimes as you're watching the, whether those murder mysteries or whatever, you wonder, okay, is this guy gonna be a bad guy? And at first you think that maybe he's the bad guy. Now, with Hallmark, you always know who the guy is not gonna make it, okay? He's the guy at the beginning, the boyfriend or whatever, and of course he gets lost and they meet this other one, okay? You know, okay? Here you're, you're wondering, okay? You got that question, okay, is the law bad or is the law good? Paul from the front door says, let me just say, the law is not sin. God forbid. He just showed them, okay, in verses one through six of the chapter, he had told them that they had died to the law and that the law was the old way of letter. Now, some people may have thought in those first few verses and over the letter that Paul had been bad-mouthing the Mosaic law that had been given to Israel for all those years. And what he answers very clearly is, no way, it's not a bad guy. He then shows how the Mosaic law is of incredible value. It was valuable then, and it's valuable. And he gives some reasons for it. And one of the reasons is this. The law uncovers our sin. It helps us see our sin. In fact, you know James uses the illustration as you and I look into the perfect law of liberty like a mirror. Okay, what does a mirror do? Okay, you got up this morning, you rolled out of bed, you walked into the, the bathroom, and you looked in the mirror and you says, man, we got problems. Okay, and it pointed out what you need to fix. It showed you areas that were not according to the standard that you have in order to leave the house. So it corrected you. In the same way, he shows us, okay, our condition. And Paul gives a specific instance of this by pointing people to the 10th commandment. What is the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Okay. He says, as I looked at the 10 commandments, it was good because it showed me in the law that I had a problem. And I had a problem with coveting. Now, Paul here begins to use a personal pronoun. If you'll catch the text, he begins to use the word I. In fact, he'll use the word I, and this is the beginning of what I believe is an autobiographical section of him talking a little bit about himself. We'll explain more, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday, because a lot of you are looking forward to finding out what Brian thinks about the second part of chapter 7, those of you who have studied it. But let me just say, I'll explain that in two weeks. 
But he showed, he basically says, what the Mosaic law did to me was it showed me the coveting that I had in me. Of course, the Ten Commandments shows us, it's one of the Ten Commandments, if you look at it, of, in, in, you could say, a little bit different with that command from all the other ones, maybe except the first one, is it shows us that sin is not simply external acts or actions. Our sin, in many ways, is internal. In fact, look at this command again. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. It says, you shall not covet. But he doesn't stop there. He gets specific. Your neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And to translate it in our day, okay, in Roswell, there's always a little house that's a little bit bigger than yours in a better location, has more amenities to it. We live in a realm where, of course, pornography and all of this comes. And what he says is if you covet another person's wife or a woman that's not your wife, he says you, you can do this in your heart and it's sin. He says, uh, the ox and the donkey, maybe that was their transportations. I mean, there are a lot of nice cars. I mean, you just drive down Highway 9 and just look at the dealerships. There's always going to be something, oh, I wish I had that. And that commandment, thou shalt not covet, if you really think about it and you think about your own life honestly, you will realize that you have broken the law. I read to you in our scripture reading how Jesus, of course, the perfect applier of the law in the Sermon on the Mount, was going after the Pharisees who had said, hey, just live according to the letter of the law. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And what does Jesus do in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, now you've heard, don't murder. But then Jesus stops and says this, but if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you shall be in danger of the judgment. Oh, you've heard that you're not to commit adultery, but then Jesus says, but I say unto you that if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery. And Jesus takes it on the internal, which has been always the reason for the law, to show us and uncover our sin. We are all lawbreakers. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not come to abolish them. Jesus said, I'm come to fulfill them. He says, I am going, not one iota or dot shall have passed from the law till all be fulfilled. And what Jesus showed was what the law always intended, and it was the in internal. Now, Paul is now saying, I. And what is he saying here? Paul as we know from other texts, he for a long time lived as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He kept the letter of the law, he thought. And he had deceived himself for a time. But evidently, at some point, Paul began to understand and began to see that he was a sinner. And I think it even happened before he was on the road to Damascus. Because you remember when Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus, he said this, Hey, Paul or Saul, isn't it hard that you are kicking against the pricks? And the idea is it's almost like a, a mule or an ox when it's plowing and there's this little poking rod that the person who's leading it would poke it to keep it going. But oftentimes an ox would be kicking against it. And I think the Spirit of God was convicting Paul and showing him that he was a coveter. Because he says, I didn't know it until I, I was confronted with this idea of coveting. And I re began to see that I was a sinner. He was probably in many ways before that like the rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler? He comes to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he, he basically said, uh, you need to, uh, and Jesus knew that he was self-righteous. 
He threw out a bunch of commands, and he says, oh, all of these I have kept from my youth up. I've done all of those things. So what does Jesus do? Graciously, he goes to the internal, his own gods of loves, of money. And he says, okay, then go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And he began to touch his idols and show them that he was one who coveted. He coveted that, own, that, that very money. So Paul, the law, what it did for him was it helped him to see that he was a sinner through his coveting. But that was not all that the law did. The law, number one, uncovered his sin, but the law also took it a step further. It aroused his sin. Look again at verse 8. It says this, but sin, seizing an opportunity, and it'll say that same little phrase, seizing an opportunity a little bit later, through the commandment. So sin took advantage of the commandment. It seized an opportunity. It produced in me all kinds of covetousness. What he means by this is that sin oftentimes uses law, the Mosaic law, to set up an outpost to get you into more sin. Just like a Kingdoms who are trying to conquer other kingdoms, in order to infiltrate the land a little bit more, they'll set up an outpost so they can invade a little bit more. And what he's saying here is this, God, sin used the Mosaic law as an outpost to take advantage of my rebellious spirit to produce in me more sin. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the most famous men who preached from the book of Romans, I visited his church a number of weeks ago in London. As he begins to describe what he meant by this, how sin seizing an opportunity, he suggested the idea of a fulcrum. Some of you are like, what is a fulcrum? Okay. A fulcrum is what is used, let's say there's this massive boulder and you got to move it and there's no way for you to move it. So you get a little, uh, another log or another stone, and then you get a long bar, and you put that little stone by the big stone, and then you put the bar in it, and you use the, the other stone, the smaller one, as leverage or as a fulcrum to move the bigger stone. What Paul is saying is this. Sin used the law, which was good, to leverage and use it to arouse more sin in our lives. The law was not bad, but it brought sin more and more to the surface. I remember a number of years ago, I went back to visit a camp that I'd worked at during the summers in college. And as I hit the campsite, they have this massive ball field, and on this particular day, as I'm walking across the ball field, I notice there's these grubs everywhere on this particular ball field. And I'm like, how did all these grubs come to the surface? And evidently, what the landscaper did was it, it laid down some sort of chemical or something like that on this particular piece of land that caused what was already in there to come to the surface. The chemical was not necessarily bad, unless you're really careful about environments or whatever, but it was trying to take away the disease and what was causing the problems on the ball field to come to the surface. And in the same way, what the law did as it was laid down, it brought to surface all of our sin. In fact, it aroused it because of it capitalized on our rebellious spirit. Look what it says at the end of verse 8. It produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So for a time, for Paul, sin li lied dead in his life, and it looked like he was fine, but it was in there. Paul then talks about, I believe, his former life before he came to Christ here. Look what he says in verses 9 and 10. 
He says, I was alive. I was once alive apart from the law. I didn't understand fully what the law said. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life to me proved to be death to me, he says. Now, as I said, I think Paul's talking here about his pre-conversion. Now, some would say, I mean, give you some interpretation. Some would say that Paul's talking about before his bar mitzvah, okay, before he became like a son of the law, he was just living life, and then he realized the law was what he had to keep. Some people believe that he's talking about, he's just using this, there was a day, and he's speaking in solidarity to the time when Israel was before 1446, when they didn't have the law yet. He says, there was a time that I was alive like Israel was, but when the law came, I died. I personally believe he's talking about his pre-conversion when he kind of understood the law. The law was there, but when he really understood the intent of it and the reality of it, it killed him. He realized, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. And he says, when I saw the command and what, for what it was, I died. I mean, you and I live in a world who don't see sin. And they're living lives like they're alive. And, and sometimes they, they have everything going for them. They don't see their sin. They don't see that anything is wrong. Yeah, this world's a little mess, messed up. But they, they've never been convicted, and so they're not looking for a Savior. I'll tell you, seeing your sin is essential. You've got to see your own brokenness. You are, you're messed up. So the law uncovered our sin, it aroused our sin, and you know what it also did? It sentenced us to death. Look what it says at the end of verse 10. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. And in fact, when, when God gave the law to Israel, and he says, if you do all of this, you shall live and you will be blessed. But ultimately, what did it lead to? It led to their captivity because they couldn't keep it. And what it should have done and what it was intended to do was to push them to the Savior, the one who would come who would fulfill all the law and the prophets. And so what the law did was it basically put you in checkmate. You ever been play, playing chess and someone finally check, 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 and then they get you in checkmate and there really is nothing you can do. There is no scenario out. The law was given to uncover your sin, it aroused your sin, and it killed you and destroyed you and put you dead in your trespasses and sins. But the Mosaic law was not sin. It was good. It was like a good judge that pronounced death upon you. He had to. He was just. He was right. You did wrong. You must face the penalty for it. And that's what the text says. Look what it says in verse 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So when Paul is trying to answer these people who are attacking the gospel and saying, hey, if we follow your line of reasoning, Paul, and you're saying that we're not under law but we're under grace, and if, if we follow that reasoning, then the law is sin and, and all of this. And Paul's saying, nah, -uh, the law is good because it brought you to the point where you realize that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's why he asked the question a new way and answered it clearly in verse 13. He says it again, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become Sinful beyond measure. So, if you think that the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul has explained in chapters 3, 4, and 5 disparage the Mosaic law, you are dead wrong. It actually puts the Mosaic law in its proper place. It is good, but here it is. The Mosaic law in doing rules and trying to live by it cannot solve your problem. And if you live your life trying to keep a bunch of rules 
and trying to do things to save your soul, you are, all of your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. There were those who misunderstood the gospel, thinking that the gospel would lead to lawless lives and that they should. And there were some who wanted to return to the law. Okay, you want to know about that? We'll have to preach through Galatians. What they were doing is this. Hey, let's believe in Christ, but you're going to have to keep all the law and strive to do all of it. Christ is good, but you need the law too, and you're going to have to do it. And Paul is saying, if you do that, you are cutting yourself off from Christ because then you're going back to your own abilities and your own striving. What he says is you now have the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, and what he does is he lives in you and leads you to live lawful lives. Now, that doesn't mean, and I don't have time to explain this today, that doesn't mean that the Mosaic law is all in play. Otherwise, we have a problem because I went to a, a baseball game yesterday, and, uh, and uh, some of you uh, ate pork last week, okay? Is the Mosaic law in place? We know there are a lot of commands, and there's a lot of teaching, and you've got to understand that in its context. And probably one of the best, and to give you just an easy way to understand this, I think Paul explains it really well in his letter to the Corinthians when he says this to them, okay? To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those who were under the law, and particularly at that time, as he's trying to reach the Jews, I became as one under the law. In fact, you see him obeying a lot of those commands during the book of Acts and offering the Nazarite vow. But then he makes sure people understand, though not being myself under the law, I'm no longer under its jurisdiction. Why did he do that? That I might win those under the law. But then he says, to those outside the law, I became one outside the law. I mean, I was living, I was eating pork. I was doing all of these things. I was not living according to the Mosaic law. But he says this, not being outside the law of God, but under this new law, the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. So some of you would say, okay, I need some more details about how, what is the, this law of Christ? How do I live this out? Well, let me tell you, the f first thing is you got to choose Jesus. And you got to make a commitment in your life, God, I will follow you wherever you want. Your commands are what my commands, and you're going to do what he says. You're going to make disciples of Jesus, and you're going to teach people to observe all of Jesus' commands because he is with you always. And if you're going to teach him to observe it, that means you're, you're obeying all of Jesus' commands. But this comes out of a commitment to Jesus Christ. So the question is, is the law good? If the law is good, yes, which it is, who's to blame for all of this? So we recognize that the law is the good guy. Who's the bad guy? Well, identify sin as the murderer. Okay, sin is clearly identified as the, our problem. Look what it says in verse 8. But sin, there it is, we've identified them. Go to verse 11. For sin, there he is again. And then I love verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was what? It was sin. It's almost like that murderer missed you. Aha! He's the one. It's sin. The law didn't do it. He's a good guy. It's sin. Now, don't just think of sin as being, oh, this, this thing outside of us. It was you who were in sin. You're a sinner. It was you. You're a sinner. We inherited both the guilt and the corrupted nature of Adam. All of us, when we were born, we were born into the first man in Adam. It's your default mode. If you're here today and you have never made a commitment 
and embrace Jesus Christ as your master and your treasure in life, where you are right now is you are in Adam at this moment because that's the default mode of every person. When you understand the law and how you broke it, he gave you the law to show you that you're a lawbreaker, it will kill you and it'll bring you to a dead end street and the only place that you can look is you can look up. You must recognize, everybody in this room, that the problem that you and I have is not with the laws. Our problem is our sin. Our world tells you that the the world's problem is that uh, man is underdeveloped. He's just immature. He hasn't fully evolved. And once we evolve more or learn more, we're going to conquer this world. If that's the case, if we're just immature people, we haven't evolved enough, we're, we're underdeveloped, then you know what? The answer is going to be found other than the gospel. Our world doesn't like to admit sin, that we are all sinners. Otherwise, if you admit sin, we've sinned against somebody. And guess who that sin we've sinned against? We've sinned against God. And what we have to do is we have to see the murderer within us. Sin. John the Baptist. You remember when John was preaching the gospel, preparing the way for Jesus? What did he do first? He began to preach on their sin and how they didn't obey the commands. He says, repent, turn, see your sin. Those of you who are stealing, he talks about soldiers, what they were doing, and how uh, tax collectors and different ones who were doing all of these things, he says, repent and look to the one who's coming, whose sandals I am not worthy to unloose. We must not be afraid. And let me just say here, we must not be afraid to recognize sin for what it is. If we don't see ourselves and other people as sinners, we won't turn them to the Savior, and we won't ourselves turn to the Savior. We can't be afraid to identify lying as lying and coveting as coveting. In adultery as adultery, it's sin. And we now live in the realm of the Spirit. And what does the Spirit do? The Bible says when the Spirit will come, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, that we need another righteousness, not our own, and of judgment, that if we don't, and we need to understand sin. So let me just stop for just a moment. And here, maybe just think together in reference to just maybe something that's hitting us right now in our current culture, even in Atlanta. You know, on on Monday, Al Mohler, uh, the president of Southern Seminary, which is kind of the flagship for the Southern Baptist Convention, he he wrote an article that was published uh, by World Magazine about North Point and about Andy Stanley. And he named the title of this article, The Train is Leaving the Station. And of course, what he's doing is he's, he's exposing just some things that he's seen at North Point, which many of us have friends, family, we, we live with them, okay? Uh, Say, saying, the train is leaving the station. Are, are they leaving, and the question is, are they leaving evangelicalism? Are they leaving the gospel here? And the issue that has brought this to light was that they are participating in allowing the use of their facility for an event to help LGBTQ parents and ministry leaders navigating that particular difficulty. Now, if that was it, okay, let me just say that's to be applauded. I mean, we, we are all sinners, every one of us. Whether you're caught in, you're a liar, whether you're an adulterer, or whether you're caught in same-sex sin, 
Sin is sin, and all sin will lead us to hell, and all of us need help in reference to that. Our church should be a place where sinners come and are helped, and, are, and we want those people to come and hear the message of the gospel. We want them to know just like us, we are all sinners. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Our church should be a way, a place for sinners to come, and we ought to be. Because let me just say, we have many people in our church who are navigating those very issues. And that's to be expected. We live in a broken world, and the more we live in it, it's going to hit all of your homes. Because Satan's going to attack in all new ways. Now, the article addressed the problem in that two of the speakers at this event are in homosexual marriages at this time. And that a third at this event has changed his stance from, you could say, the historic biblical position of monogamous marriage between a husband, a man and a woman. Now, I hope, okay, I hope that I will get more understanding in the days ahead. I hope Andy will respond to it at some point because I want to be very careful and we all need to be careful he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Okay, and I'm not answering the matter here, but I'm just as a church because it's something that is hitting our realm of life. We have to be careful. And you say, what do we need to be careful of? We must not be fearful to anyone to address sin as sin. Yes, okay, Jesus welcomes sinners. And you know what? We want sinners to come, and we, we want to welcome sinners because we're all sinners. We're all broken, okay? But it's interesting, Jesus, as he dealt with sinners, okay, as he dealt with sinners, if a sinner wasn't going to admit his sin and he was going to be rebellious and live in it, he handled them differently, didn't he? If they, if they were humble and they were broken, sin no what? What did he say? Sin no more. But to the ones who didn't want to admit their sin and were prideful, you know what often happened? He left them and, 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 and he was hard on them in the same way. Okay, you know what our problem is? All of our problem, this whole world's problem, it's sin. And we do have to address sin as what it is and that the Lord is good and he will forgive. So we have learned that we need to recognize the law as a good guy. We need to recognize sin as the murder and sin is sin and we have to see it. And then finally, I want you to see this. Look to Jesus as the Savior. That's my last point. Did you know that Jesus is never mentioned in our text this morning? But he is, of course, the ultimate hero. He's the one who brought Paul to this point, and he's going to be the one that Paul talks about all after this. If you remember in chapter 3, when he brought up the law in chapter 3, he said this in verse 21, but now the righteousness of, the, of God has been manifest apart from the law. It was not the law. Although the law and the prophets witnessed to him the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. What the law does is it shows us that we're sinners. And when we see our sin and we understand that we are sinners, when we, when we do that, it causes us and by grace, we finally look for a Savior. Paul's intent here was to rescue the law, implicate sin, but to offer the only solution, which is Jesus Christ. He can forgive all your sin. If you have Jesus, you are saved from sin and death. You did die with Jesus, and you are now alive in him. 
You are justified by faith in Jesus, not in the law. And you will not be sanctified by the law. And I'll I'll just add this. If you think that once you get saved, I believed in Jesus, now I'm going to just try to keep all this law and do all of this. You were not saved by your doing. You were saved by your faith in Christ. And you will be sanctified and you will be changed, not by the law, but by Christ as you live according to him. And he will teach you how to fulfill the law. So the law was put in its rightful place. It's a good guy. Sin is addressed as the murderer. And you and I need to be willing to call sin, sin. Because when we finally see that we're sinners, it causes us to look for, and I'll tell you this, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't matter what you've done, what other sin that you're caught in today, let me tell you that Jesus Christ can forgive any sin. And he can teach you how to live soberly, righteously, and godly in what? In this present world. Because he came to deliver you from this present world. And he can transform you from the inside out. So we've learned a right understanding of the law and sin can lead you to the Savior. Okay? I want you to understand it. The law was our tutor. Sin was the culprit. Jesus is the Savior. Paul wanted them to be in the proper all in the proper spots to support the gospel. So what? We can learn from the law, but remember that the law cannot save. Okay, parents, if you're here today, if you're trying to save your kids through law, okay, I mean, we all like, as parents, like to lay down the law. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and remind our kids this is what the law says. But actually, all the law does, it cannot save a kid. And if you think that that's going to be the thing that's going to rescue your kids, you're in trouble. The only thing that's going to rescue your kids is Jesus. Now, does that mean that you don't have any laws and just, hey, whatever you guys want to do, stay up as late as you want? No, you lay some down, but ultimately all of it's to lead them to the Savior who ultimately can save them. And as as I applied to you, the law is not going to sanctify you. If you're just trying to, i got to obey, 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 obey. You want to walk with Jesus, and he will teach you how to obey. Live your life for him. Don't be afraid to identify sin, but do it like Jesus did. Offer grace and forgiveness to the repentant. And for all of us, run to Jesus Christ, not simply for our justification, but for our sanctification. Run to him. If you're here today, and you have never started a relationship with Jesus Christ, let me invite you today, after the service, I'm going to be at our visitor reception. It'll probably take me a little bit to get there, but once I get there, if you want to talk about the gospel, if you need to have someone expound a little bit more, we would love to do that today. But would you join me as I close our service with prayer? Father, Lord, I know this was a complicated and difficult message of just helping us understand it. But I ask that you would etch these truths into our hearts. Lord, help us to see the law is good. Help us to see our problem with sin. Help us not to be afraid to understand sin and how all of us are like this and be willing to call sin what it is, sin. But then, Lord, may it all lead us to the Savior. May it lead us to that. I ask that you would guide us to this end. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ and all the people of the Lord said, Amen. Have a good week.